All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob. It's Monday, so that means it's Better Call Saul Day. Uh, so we have another great episode. Uh, it could have started out as kind of a filler episode, but again, a lot of great character stuff in here. So this is season four, episode six. It's called Pinata, and let's get started. So full spoilers ahead if you have not seen the episode. Uh... <laughs> Uh, this one was kind of like, I was going, man, how am I going to review this one? Uh, I kind of had a hard day and I was not maybe quite in the mental, uh, state to deal with kind of a slow episode, but it picks up. So here we go. Uh, all right. So with Kim's storyline and, and Jimmy's storyline, uh, it's Kim's starting to be, well, let's talk about the cold open first off. It's great to see Michael McKeon back, even if it's just in a like a little guest star flashback. But in this, uh, first off, I love the uh, the Oscar pool. It's really great. It also gives us a great uh, link into what time period this flashback takes place at, because this was the year that uh, Pacino won for Scent of a Woman, it sounds like. Uh, Howard's End was playing. So this is a, like really, I was in high school, I think, when Scent of a Woman was uh, in... Uh, like that year for the Oscars. So damn, like we're talking early nineties. So Jimmy was like working in the mail room and, and they don't look like they've aged much. <laughs> in fact, they, they, I don't think they really did anything uh, to, to try to age and de-age anybody except for uh, Michael McKeon here. Um, but you get the gist right off the bat. Kim's on the fast track. Kim's always thinking about the law. Jimmy's thinking about being Jimmy. Jimmy's just, you know, kind of doing his thing. And he kind of sees through this scene that she's already trying to join the club. Be part of the, you know, Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill family. And Jimmy is definitely kind of an outsider. But he wants in. But he also does things his own way. And I like that we get to that library scene where he kind of just is like, maybe this is where I, you know, going into that room... Starting to study the law seriously is how he kind of is. It's his in. Like, I'm, I, I want to be a part of this. I want to be, you know, part with my brother and the girl I like and, you know, part of something. That's at least my take on it. I could be wrong. Um, but when we get to, like, where Kim is, like, distracted, you know, she keeps wanting to go to these, you know, public defender cases while she's doing, uh, you know, the uh, Mesa Verde case. Um, and it's not a bad idea, her going to Schwe uh, Schweigler and Coakley. In fact, it's a pretty damn good idea. But she doesn't do that until she sees, like, the Wexler-McGill idea that Jimmy has. Seeing that that's what his plans are. Um, that in 10 months when he gets his, uh, you know, or maybe it's nine by now, I don't know. Um, that when he gets his lot of, you know, law practice you know, going again, he plans on her and him going right back to where it was. And, you know, even in that morning when she, when they, when they talk and he tells her that he was not going to go to the shrink, um, and they both have their, you know, their things, you know, you got to do what's best for you, she tells him. And even though she's disappointed, you're like, there's that, that thing that's already going on in her head. Like she, in my head, in my opinion, she has no intention of ever being in a practice with Jimmy. Again, not that they ever really were. They were, you know, in the same building, but they never were part of the same practice. Um, she would help him occasionally. He would help her, but they never have been joined together. And she's, I don't feel like she's ever trusted him enough to completely uh, join together as far as a practice goes. And in this, this just pretty much cements it in my mind. That she has never had, she never will have intentions to be a part of it. And especially with what went down with Chuck and how they handled it with the whole thing. She just wants, she, I think that this was like kind of a win-win for her going there. She gets to have somebody help her with her Mesa Verde problem. She gets to work her public defender part, but she also gets an out. She never, she can at least, you know, give Jimmy a legitimate reason to why her and him wouldn't be able to practice together. 
without her seeming bad. And I don't think, you know, he, she was supposed to know quite that they were, he was, what he was planning. It sounds like, you know, they, he assumed, and I think maybe he assumed that she assumed that he, you know, that they were going to do it. Um, so when she, you know, kind of ambushes him with it at the restaurant, um, you know, he pretty much, like, when he goes away and he's kind of like, it almost seems like he's having a panic attack. Or just kind of like, he's had the, you know, the floor drop out from underneath him. The realization that she has no intention of being, you know, part of a practice with him, I think. I think he realizes now that this, that's it. Like, that ship has sailed for them. And so I think that's what explains kind of how he really goes all out later on in this episode with what he's doing uh, <laughs> um, later on. Uh, it's also kind of like sad when he gets that phone call, not just because he could have helped if he had his law degree, you know, his law practice going, he could have helped uh, them with that guy with the will. But when he realizes that one of his clients, the one that had the Alpine Shepherd boy, the one from his commercial, uh, that she had died, there was kind of a personal thing to it. He cared about these people. He does care about these people. The fact that she was buried already and the fact that she died is also a correlation with how he's feeling about Chuck, losing Chuck. So it's like if somebody else close to him is gone, or at least something that kind of, you know, death connects the two. Um, you know, the way he watches the tape with this, you know, kind of a nostalgia sentimentality about it. Um, and, you know, sending them to Hamlin McGill. Uh, that scene with Howard and him is great. I feel like he's lashing out at Howard. Uh, not really, you know, like, yes, kind of to help him, but really, I think he just wanted to lash out. Uh, I think he's yelling at Howard because he can't yell at Chuck. Um, and poor Howard still, like, it's like he's just going down there. His company's just going down the tubes. Uh, I do like, he's like, fuck you, you know, like, and I like that. Use it. Yes. I love that. Um, I hope things work out for Howard uh, in some way, you know, but as we know, like, I, you know, we never see Howard or hear about Howard or Kim, like, in on Breaking Bad, so I just don't know where this is all headed, but um, then let's talk about, uh, yeah, let's talk about Mike. Uh, the scene with his, uh, his, uh, daughter-in-law, I mean, I guess that was needed. I don't know if that really fits in this episode, but fine. Uh, just because how it starts with the, the warehouse and, you know, goes on with the, and bookends with the warehouse. Um, it just seemed like that scene didn't really need to f really fit in there, but it's still a nice scene. Um, her, you know, base, you know, telling him, you know, that she wouldn't ever forget Matt. It was nice. Um, I don't really feel like he should have to justify himself. I'm glad that he stands by what he said, but that, yeah, maybe time and place and all that. But what's really great here, again, is the warehouse scene where they're setting up the German workers who are going to build the super lab that will be later on in Breaking Bad. Um, the, great two, the great things about these, these two scenes is, again, just the detail. Uh, and, and it changes the way you see uh, how things play out in Breaking Bad because getting to see how Gus and Mike built this this what was going to be this great big empire of theirs and knowing where it's headed in this kind of like you know how doomed it is but just the fact that how much it makes you think how much what Walter does in Breaking Bad just completely you know undercuts what Gus had built and how much time and effort went into this. The detail, the level of detail that Mike puts into this place with these two guys. At first, I didn't quite know what was happening in this scene. But just, you know, you can't just have these guys stay here. They have to live here. You know, we don't want them climbing the walls. I love that. Um, when they actually get there, of course, there's that one asshole, Kai. There has to be one, that, and I'm like, man, I, I just wanted Mike to say, you're done, okay? You're out of here. You're not going to work out. Because it just kind of feels like by letting him stay and not just saying, look, that guy, he's got to go. I kind of feel like that's how Mike really would have been right from the start. Like, 
<laughs> you need to find somebody else to take this guy's place. But instead, I get him, you know, for dramatic effect, because you know that something's going to happen, right? You, something has to happen. <laughs> because he wouldn't, you know, when he goes to the, to the shed and, you know, he says, watch that guy. It has to have a payoff. I don't think that Mike would let it really get that to that point, but for dramatic effect and for our own enjoyment later on when this guy steps out of line or something happens, it will be satisfying. But I still feel like Mike would never have even let it get to that pitch, really. So, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then we have Gus. Gus having this great scene. And another thing, it, it changes the way you look at Breaking Bad. And it changes the way you look at Gus. Because it talks about, you know, when he talks about patience. And the patience he has. And what the story about what would happen to him when a, with a, like a raccoon-like creature, a Kawada Monday. I think you, they're all over the Southwest. They're kind of like raccoons. Um, but just what he did with this animal as a young boy and the patience that he had to take revenge. Um, Gus's relationship with feelings about revenge and just and the feelings of with, with this animal and with Hector... Um, it just makes you think, like, to those people that you might hate. Uh, people, you know, like, hate's a strong word, but, you know, we've all got those people just about that were like, you know, maybe that have wronged us. And we're like, man, someday, you know, someday when they least expect it, you know, I just would like to just get one over on that person. But we never do it. We never have the patience or... You know, the fear of what would happen if we were to do something, uh, you know, I'm not talking about murder or anything like that, but, you know, just that, that revenge, that dish best served cold, that patience that it takes to get one over on somebody really, really good. Most of us don't have that. We don't know people that have really done things like that. That's like in movies and stuff, but this is like a special case, like that, that you actually get to see this play out, this long game, this long game of vengeance that yes, we know where it ends if you watch Breaking Bad, but it just, the, the calculation and the patience of Gus Fring and the fact that he'll just sit there in this room and talk, tell this story to an unconscious Hector, just put so many great layers on on it and I mean Giancarlo Esposito oh, I mean yes he ends up here but it's just the actor I mean Gus Fring is just one of the greatest villains on TV that has ever graced the screen uh, so it's just fantastic I can't wait to get see more of how this plays out even though we know I mean but I just I loved all the details just all the extra little nuggets that we get in this it's just so fantastic so and let's finish up with Jimmy's story the final part of Jimmy's story where yes he, he gets all these cell phones again he plans on selling them uh, you know I, the whole long how many he has i mean i guess that scene really didn't really need to be in there the how how many he has and the length and the, the time it takes to get him back into the office what's really great is that phone call that he's talking about like about the pinatas you don't really know what they're talking about but you know he's talking to the vet because he talks about the fish and taking care of the fish um, so you know he's setting something up so when he goes back out there in his, you know, freaking Sopranos jumpsuit, you know, tracksuit or whatever, and confronts those kids who are just so great at being those douchey kids that you just want to just pound the shit out of. I mean, those are the type of kids that just need a beat down like every single day. Um, <laughs> so like when, when they get set up, it is just so great. You know, he, he think he's really trying. He's really selling this. He, it's a reasonable thing he's offering these kids, you know. But it's like he knows that no matter what, I guess, that these kids are just going to, no matter what he offers them, no matter how, you know, great the actual plan is to just have a steady revenue stream instead of robbing me all the time, he knows they're so stupid and shitty. They're not going to take the deal. So when they do get trapped and... This was what I said last week, that this was probably where, you know, Jimmy was going to, you know, bring in muscle. Because now he realizes he can't just be out there. But now he doesn't need muscle because of this. And I love it. Um, that they get, you know, they, they, they trap the kids, they get the guns, they tie them up. 
they hang them upside down in a pinata factory or whatever that is you know there's a whole lot of pinatas and just that speech you know hey you guys had your chance this is like a kind of a negan type scene you know i got the baseball bat and the threats and everything and you know all of them are gonna get taken down and he just lets it play out all the way up to that like the bat right in front of the kid's face you know he gets to be the tough guy that he you know when like at the end of last episode he's like you know these guys never would have messed with me back in the day you know um <laughs> and so you know you get one warning and that was it i also love that it was huel so boom again i called it i mean i guess it's not that much of a stretch that that's who it would be that he called i was a little disappointed that it wasn't bill burr the other guy but i think that might have been another one of the vomino's pest guys from breaking bad i could be wrong but anyway great ending to the episode uh, yeah, we've only got four episodes left, so last next week's episode, somebody calls him Saul Goodman. So, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm wrong. I guess we are going to see the version of Saul, like a version of Saul Goodman at least, before the lawyer part. So, uh, he's at least using the pseudonym now, uh, whether or not that guess, I mean, if he changes his name or what later legally, I don't know. But anyway... That's it. It's another solid, 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 great episode. So uh, if you like this video, please hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, hit the button, all that jazz. Uh, and then, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for choosing to watch my review of this. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye.